ask Paul Sublett, um, assistant pastor at Old Baptist Church, to uh, do a prayer. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you today. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We're looking at Thanksgiving weekend. I pray that we all find ourselves looking to you and, and bringing praise to your name for everything that we receive in our hands from you. And I pray that you watch over us and care for us in this meeting today as we talk. Help us to enjoy the time together and visit and learn much and share much. We can count on you to help us find a solid ground to build this country back on. And we need your help, and we, we ask for your help in that. Bless us this day. Bless this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Today... We're going to actually change our meeting around just a tad today because what happened, one of our keynote speakers, uh, Senator Ralph Shorty, had an emergency and he had to go out of town. However, knowing that, this is probably going to work out just fine because we're going to give you more information today than Ralph would ever bring from the state out. That's a little bit of a joke and it won't get any better than that. We're going to bring you information. It's going to be Mike Reynolds. Uh, representing Mike Reynolds is going to talk about the Oklahoma ethics and what's going on down there with the Ex Ethics Commission, the board down there, which I think that you're going to find very interesting, positively or negatively, however you may say. You're going to find find that very interesting. So, so get ready for some questions on that because this is going to be, I think most of us are going to be saying, really, that's going on? Really? Okay. So I'm going to let Mike Reynolds, representing Mike Reynolds, start out. Than today. Go, go ahead and take the front mic and let's tell us what you know about ethics. <laughs> <laughs> or being unethical. Well, as little as I know, but the people that I've been dealing with know a lot less. So I can say that. <laughs> Earlier this week, I went to the Oklahoma Ethics Commission. They had a meeting on Monday. Um, the way the Oklahoma Ethics Commission works is um, I think in 1988 or so. Citizens uh, adopted a constitutional amendment and kind of made the ethics mission the fourth branch of government. Uh, that they don't have a lot of ability to do much, but they're kind of independent. The ethics mission <clears throat> proposes rules, but really, in my mind, they ought to just be called the Oklahoma Campaign Finance Commission. Uh, and and I'm, that's not, I'm not trying to be funny or anything, but that's basically what it's about: it's, it is recording campaign finance stuff. And they don't do that very well. Um, so anyway, Constitution, what happens is whenever they want to adopt new rules, the Ethics Commission discusses them during the year, and in December they vote on any new rules that they want to go into effect. In January they have to take a second vote to finalize it. And then those are presented to the legislature uh, for I would say for approval or rejection, but it doesn't exactly work like that. What happens is, is unless the legislature rejects those rules, then the new things that they propose effectively have the effect of becoming law. They're not really statutes, they're ethics rules. So the legislature can reject, reject them. And we have on some occasions rejected a few of the rules they adopted. About four or five years ago, probably four years ago, there was a big push. There's always a push by lobbyists, who else, to um, to make the rules worse as far as I'm concerned. But certainly to change the rules and to liberalize the amount of money that can be given. There was a push on a few years ago by a commissioner, Commissioner John Ray. Um, and Commissioner Ray wanted to move the amount that could be get contributed by lobbyists from $300 to $1,000 per calendar year. And I'll let somebody, there we go. Uh, they also were going to allow for legislators to receive tickets to any event that had, I don't remember the exact rules, something like national consequences. You could, you could have ticket expenses paid. It's like they're, they were arguing in the meeting, so this would be good for Oklahoma. If, if OU, uh, or if, if the Oklahoma, 
drama students do a play on Broadway. It'd be good for legislators to be there. Yeah, it'd be great for the legislators. I don't know what it is for the state. But, I mean, it's those kind of ridiculous arguments from, from very significant people. So you couldn't hardly mock them too much, although I tried. Um, anyway, after visiting at length with Commissioner Rayleigh, he ultimately changed his rule, forget the tickets, and instead of increasing the limit from $300 to 1000 he moved it from 300 down to 100 That's right. And that's what got adopted. Well, we came along to this week. And I was going to go to a meeting Monday. Did go to a meeting Monday. But I've been doing some research as a result of the Randy Terrell trial. Uh, it was unrelated to that. It was just a, the ethics, had to do with the Ethics Commission, talking about when a person's a candidate. And I tell you, there are hundreds of people that are candidates for office and the office was elected six or eight years ago. And according to the legal definition, they're still a candidate for office. So it's kind of a weird deal. I was doing research about that. So I went to the Ethics Commission to do some speaking about that and discovered that they were in the process of adopting their rules. And, and on the, the, the meeting this week, they were going to go section by section through three different parts of the law. They were going to have to cast about 30 votes section by section, to decide if they wanted to propose these new rules. Well, I wasn't there for that. I hadn't studied them, but I began watching the presentation. And it was pretty ridiculous. <coughs> a little more background, though. The Ethics Commission has a new executive director. His name is Lee Slater. Lee Slater was the Secretary of the State Senate back in the 80s. And I believe that uh, at that point, the Secretary of the Senate also serves as the head of the election board. Somewhere along there, he left that job, and he went to law school, as I understand it, and he certainly, at one point, was in partnership with Marvin York, who was the pro tem of the Senate. So the, the firm was called York and Slater. Mr. Slater was used by the Democrats in the Senate, Democrats in the House, and Democrats in state agencies to block all of the open records requests. I did open records requests at rural enterprises, Mr. Slater's, down there saying, no, you can't have those. Those aren't, I, we, other people do open records requests. He's their go-to guy for what? Non-transparency. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's add to that that uh, Glenn Coffey, the pro tem of the Senate, out of office now, he actually partnered up with Lee Slater. <clears throat> Mr. Slater had a campaign finance company do ethics reporting. So he'd been at the commission every month, as I had for about 10 years. Uh, behind the scenes, promoting rule changes and things of that nature. Probably, I don't recall specifically, but I think he was be promoting the changes on the, the increased limits. Well, the meeting Monday, I'm there to speak about some other stuff. That's what I'm really focused on. But it came along to several sections. And it's like, I can't believe they're even doing this. It's astounding. Section, I think it's 15. There were, there were three consecutive sections. Section 15 said that um, lobbyists could get, well, first of all, I passed a section earlier that was going to increase the limit from $100 to $500 uh, per lobbyist. Well, that's horrible. But that was the first step. The next step said, section 15 said that a lobbyist could provide every member of the legislature a dinner once a year. Now, the excuse for that, that someone got up and said, well, the reason they need to do that is because a lot of times the legislature works really hard and they're in late at night. And so it's, they don't have time to go out to dinner and so lobbyists will go out there and, and buy box dinners for everybody. So it's just not that big a deal. And because right now they have to go report that they bought everybody a $7.57 dinner or whatever. And we just, we don't want them to have to do that. So I'm going, yeah, right, okay. But anyway, so I didn't say anything. Uh, the next one said once a year, lobbyists could buy every member of a caucus dinner. And that's like, well, you know, here's what happens is uh, the Republicans have a caucus, the Democrats have a caucus, it's in the middle of a busy day, they don't have the time to go out to lunch, and so the lobbyists will again will buy like a box lunch. And uh, so they're having to report that little minus. So we're going to just say they don't have to report that. They just said they bought the caucus. And a, a, a gentleman, I think, from Common Cause, who, who's a group that really is for ethics and government, 
He got up and said, well, no, wait a minute. This doesn't say anything about the lunch having to be at the Capitol or anything like that. It just says they can buy them a lunch or buy them a meal. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, well, but that's all right. They voted on it, pass it. So the next one, at that point, I was, I was getting kind of frustrated, but I wasn't there to talk about that. So the next, uh, the next one was, once a year, the lobbyist could buy members of a committee a meal. So, okay, I'm sorry, Mike can't sit any longer. <laughs> so I went up and I said, okay, so you guys, now, here's what you're doing. You're saying that once a year, I, I, I believe I, I don't know if I said all this precisely, but I'll try to recreate the conversation. I recently went to the OU Texas football game. And I went to a steakhouse when I was down there, Perry Steakhouse. It was about $150 a person. I mean, it was like a special deal. That I, we, my family, we've never done that before. But there's a lot of people that go to the mahogany restaurant here in Oklahoma City, and, and they go to the new restaurant in Devon Tower, and those meals get very expensive. Uh, they can be more expensive if you don't have a price limit on them because there's a lot of legislators that drink. They'll have a bottle of wine. They'll have a few drinks. And so those meals can far exceed $100. So what you're doing today, pass one, one statute or one rule that says you can buy the whole legislature a meal. And it doesn't say a box lunch at the Capitol. It says you can buy them a meal. So you can take them anywhere in the state you want and spend any amount. Then once a year, you can take every member of, the caucus, of a caucus. Well, that's every other legislator. And then you can take <coughs> members of the committee once a year. But guess what? I'm on five committees. <laughs> guess how many committees the Speaker of the House is on? 26. So once a year, you can take the Speaker of the House to 28 meals of unlimited cost. Once a year, you take the program and send 28 meals of unlimited cost. When the previous limit was $100 a year. And you guys say you're trying to do what's best for the citizens of Oklahoma. Yeah, I so I said that. <laughs> well, they amended the third one to say it had to be a meal at the Capitol. And after they did that, one of the commissioners said, well, maybe we should amend the other two, also say a meal at the Capitol. <laughs> And uh, another commissioner said, well, we already voted on those, so we can't do that. <laughs> so then we keep going along, and the next uh, rule change that I took interest in was one that said that once a year, uh, institutions of higher ed could provide to each legislator two tickets to an event that had students in the activity, if it was in the state of Oklahoma. And so uh, I got up again. I said, this, that's pretty special. I said, you know, previously, higher ed could give us a, a, a thing of value of up to $100. And what most legislators, if, if they do it, and I do, we can get a ticket, a season ticket to OU football game. And I, th I think it costs $497. I can buy mine for $397 because I get a $100 discount. And that's, that'll be on my ethics report, or, and their report too. And you'll see that. <clears throat> so $100. But I said, you know what? Oh, you playing OSU shoot a couple weeks. So if this rule is in effect, I could get two tickets from OU to that game. I could get two tickets from OSU to that game. That'd be $400 to me right there on that one game. Of course, then I, OU could give me 10 more tickets to the other uh, home games I had. OSU could give me 10 more tickets to the other home games they had. Then every other university of higher ed in Oklahoma could give me tickets. And then I could go get tickets for the baseball games, the, the basketball games, the volleyball games, the track meets, et cetera, et cetera. You're giving away tens of thousands of dollars in direct cost to the taxpayers who are giving us tickets and indirect cost because of the votes it'll be buying. And once again, you're trying to tell me that you guys are doing what's best for the citizens of Oklahoma. Unbelievable. I said, uh, well, that humiliated them enough that no commissioner would even make a motion to adopt that particular rule. The other one moved and adopted, but that one they wouldn't even move and adopt it. So they can say we didn't pass it. Well, they would have, believe me. The last rule, which I didn't even speak to, because it's like, what's the point, um, was a rule 
that said that within the last 14 days of a campaign, the Ethics Commission will not accept any complaints for investigation. But let me be very specific and help Mr. Clark Jolly and Ms. Mary Cooks here watching. Clark Jolly committed ethics violations in his last campaign. Clark Jolly had a campaign that said, Clark Jolly for undecided. And the rules specifically say, he raised 200, over $200,000 while he was running for undecided. But he was holding fundraisers that said Clark Jolly for the state senate. Mr. Bob Donahue filed a complaint, and the Ethics Commission uh, chose not to, not to do anything about that complaint. Clark Jolly said he was cleared. Mary Cooksey said on the floor of the House that he was cleared. That is absolutely a lie, Mr. Jolly, Ms. Cooksey. That's a lie. He was not cleared. The Ethics Commission chose not to investigate it. Now, why would they choose not to investigate it? I don't, I, I'm sure it has nothing to do with Clark Jolly being the appropriation chair of the Senate that funds the Ethics Commission budget. That, that but couldn't be it. So, and they chose not to look at the evidence, which is crystal clear. They were provided copies of the invitations that were held at Chesapeake, and I don't know where the other place was, but Governor Fallon was actually Clark Jolly's uh, guest host. Clark Jolly for State Senate. The Daily Oklahoman badmouthed myself and Mr. Donahue, I don't know if it was by name, saying, oh, this is dirty politics, they filed it late in the campaign or something to that effect. But you know what? We didn't know about it until Clark Jolly filed his reports, yeah. which were filed like the last week of April, about two weeks before the election. So we did a little investigation. We waited for about a week, filed a complaint, and the Daily Oklahoma said, oh, they've known about it. Because I had said, well, I've known about it for some time. Yeah, about a week. Sometime, I guess they were trying to imply I'd known about it for years or something. So uh, I called Mr. Commissioner. The Ethics Commission said, we're not going to investigate it. Jolly goes out there and says, hey, I'm cleared and all that stuff. I, I called Commissioner Ray, who's... Uh, no longer a member of the Ethics Commission, unfortunately. And Commissioner Rayleigh said, uh, Representative Reynolds, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but it's very frustrating. The Commission's reason for not looking at that was because they said they were troubled by the timing right before the election. Well, what do we want to do? We want to know the guys are crook after the election? We want to know somebody cheated and stole the election after the election? Or we want to know before? Well, that's another rule that they had attempted to pass again. That was Rule 30, and I didn't even speak about it in London. Uh, because of the way the Ethics Commission stuff works, if they submit these rules to us, apparently constitutionally, we either have to accept all of them or reject all of them. Well, that one, that particular rule, Mary and Cooksey actually brought a bill to the floor of the House last year to implement that same rule. I know she wishes she didn't, because it was defeated 25 to 68, I believe. And, you know, some of the people that voted for her, I'm sure it was out of sympathy. But it was soundly defeated. She had no justification. She made frivolous claims before. She, her frivolous claims were, oh, people filed frivolous claims against candidates and it makes them look bad and it may cost them the election. Mm. And I asked her, so give us an example of a frivolous claim. Well, I think we both know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I said, why did we do two? And in debate, I explained the frivolous claim. To her, a frivolous claim was Clark Jolly's violation of the ethics rules. Mm. That was Ms. Marion Cooksey's idea of a frivolous claim. So can you imagine if someone filed a complaint against you and it was frivolous and you wanted yourself cleared and now the Ethics Commission can't investigate it? So let me give you a perfect example. Six years ago, uh, I had an opponent, had a very tough race, and on the, I believe it was the Tuesday before the election, seven days before the election, there, there used to be a rule that no longer applies that said if you received there's a $5,000 limit. If, if Bob could give me $5,000 for my Mike Reynolds for 2010, then he could give me $5,000 for Mike Reynolds 2012. But nowadays, he could give it $5,000 for 2010, and then I could end that campaign, pay off my debt, 
A week later, start a new campaign, he could give me another $5,000. But back then, there was a six-month window. You couldn't take more than $5,000 during a six-month period. And that went away. I don't want to get too technical. It went away. Anyway, I had taken some money from two particular individuals several months earlier, and then later on, I started a new campaign, was not aware of the rule, and took another $5,000 from both of them. One had given me three, and the other had given me five. So the day the Oklahoman called me up and said, Representative Reynolds, it looks like you did took this campaign contribution from Ralph Harvey and this one from Mike Marshall uh, here, and then you took another one here. Is that true? I said, yeah. And uh, so they said, well, well, that's a violation of rules. I said, well, yes, it is, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, I've already fixed it. I returned the money. Mm. Now, the violation had occurred almost a year before. And I returned the money, granted just that week, when I found out it was an error. So the day the Daily Oklahoma came out, I think on the Thursday before the election, <laughs> when no ethics complaint whatsoever had been filed against me and talked about Mike Reynolds, Mr. Ethics. Yeah, look at his reports. He took uh, $8,000 in illegal contributions. <laughs> they didn't even bother to mention, mention that I'd already remedied the problem. They didn't bother to mention no ethics complaint had ever been filed. I would love for someone to file it, so I'd have been cleared. So that's the kind of ethics we have in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, one of the things I was going to mention, and then I'll open up for questions or whatever, one of the things I'm going to mention at the meeting last Monday was the fact that it appears to me, it's very difficult to get the exact numbers, but it appears to me that over $7 million in fines are owed to the Oklahoma Ethics Commission for people filing their uh, campaign reports late, not timely. They don't have the ability to enforce other than take you to court. They've only taken, to my understanding, two people to court ever. Uh, David Walters on that famous deal, I don't remember what it was now, and then Governor Keating, the Democrats took him to court on a, a bidding thing with an airplane reupholstery deal. So anyway, but one of the main campaign consulting firms in Oklahoma, not campaign consulting, I will say uh, ethics compliance, was a company called CTP Technologies. And CTP Technologies appears to me to be the largest single of offender in terms of late filing fees. Of it also appears that CTP Technologies, the general partner, or the, at least one of the main partners, is Mr. Lee Slater, the new head of the Oklahoma Ethics Commission. So, with that, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions I could. Charlie? Uh, Mike, I saw the article in the paper, and I want to tell you how much I appreciate the stands that you take. Which the, article, Charlie? Well, <clears throat> there was an article in the paper about your disappointment in the rule changes, and that's how I found out about it. Uh, my question is, who appointed Lee Slater? And who appointed the new people? Uh, get, run through that for us so we'll understand that. Great question. Yeah, great. What happens is there are five ethics commissioners. One is appointed by the head, the chief justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. I'm not sure which of those five it is that was there. One is uh, uh, appointed by the pro tem of the Senate. One's appointed by the Speaker of the House. One's appointed by the Attorney General. And one's appointed by the governor. And there was one commissioner this week that consistently voted. He only spoke against one of the particular rules that I talked about earlier. He said, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I don't like them. And he spoke against one, and then he consistently voted against him. And I thanked him after the meeting for doing that. I don't know which appointee he, he was. But unfortunately, I believe one of the appointees is certainly appointee of, of, uh, of the pro tem, Senator Coffey. And most of the things that were run through were things that uh, I'm sure would be very beneficial. Bingman. Pardon? Coffee or Bingman? Uh, coffee, I believe. But it, okay. uh, because they're like five-year terms. Yeah. But I'm not positive about that. Who appointed Slater? That's the one I really the, the five commissioners. Okay. Yeah, so the five commissioners have selected him as a new executive director. And it's not about, it's. they talked about, this is all about transparency. There's nothing they did that had any any remote connection to transparency, it's all about opening the doors for uh, uh, for lobbyists to spend untold sums on legislators to buy votes. I'm Pat, 
And I'd like to know, are, are just regular citizens allowed to attend these meetings? Thank you for asking that, because that's one of the things I wanted to mention right at the start. Yes, uh, each meeting, citizens can attend. And there will be a meeting in December where they'll vote on the final adoption of these rules. And I hope everybody in the High Noon Club, and I'll be announcing it more, comes. You, because you can speak to the rules. Now, they did make one change. I was dismayed to learn this last week that has never occurred before. It used to be they had a time for public comment. Apparently, in the week meeting before, they decided the time for public comment will only include the items that we have on the agenda. And the only items we have on the agenda are three rules that we're discussing today. So I couldn't even present the things that I had prepared for, where for the last 10 years I could have walked in and, and had a few minutes to talk about that. So, but yes, I would encourage everybody to come and I'll let you know more when that next meeting is. Well, that was my last question is, would that be some sort of, if nothing else, a deterrent or, or an intimidation type situation where they're gonna have to really pump up the truth and at least know that there are people that are actually paying attention to what they're doing and saying. Uh, it would be a great way to express your dismay as a citizen. The, uh, if it were to be meaningful, the most meaning it would have is to legislators because the Ethics Commission is going to do what the Ethics Commission wants to do. They may be uh, humiliated enough that they don't do it, but nevertheless, the legislators will have to approve those rules. So we want to, if we get enough people there, then the legislators are going to start realizing, I can't vote to approve that kind of rule because those citizens are going to come after me. Let, me. let me kind of help you out there just a little bit. There was a group called the American Islamic Council. Right? No, that's not right. American... The Ethnic Advisory Council. Ethnic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, appointed, a governor board appointed. Okay? Several people from Miami and other groups around the city started attending their meetings. We then asked, what it was, it was a Zawani group, what it was, okay? Predominantly CARE, Council of American Islamic Group. But we did, several of us went down there and they started to attend their meetings. They were very shocked, and eventually the governor removed that whole board. So the question you're asking, yes, okay, yes, okay? We need to go down there and show our public interest in that meeting, okay? The, just if legislators fight this, it's a little still a little secret group or whatever. We're not going to say secret, secret, but it's a little bit of group. So the public opinion is very, very important in your government. Okay? Now your question. Any any committees that they hold we're allowed to go to if we're if we're shown no, no. this is the ethics commission. They're not the legislature. Okay. There are state ag state agencies all have a time for public comment. The Ethics Commission will have a time for public comment, but by having a large number of people there, which could be 20 or 30, that's huge to legislators. Having a large number of people there, they're going to reflect on that when those rules come to the legislature, and then when you go to whoever your representative is and say, boy, you sure better not vote for those stupid rules the Ethics Commission passed, or I'm going to do everything I can to defeat you, they will be on notice. Okay, now let me let me do this too, okay? Now I'm not trying to sharpshoot you. I mean don't take it this way. Okay, what I'm what I'm to do. Do you know who your state representative is, your state senator? Perfect, okay? Okay, perfect. Now, everybody in this room needs to know who your elected officials are. And also, where, do you live in Oklahoma City? Oh, Midwest City. Who your city councilman and your mayor are too, okay? You need to contact those people because that's gonna be your influence. So who is your state representative? Gary Vance. And your state senator? Uh, that I'm not sure about. Okay, okay. Okay, because you read this. But again, my point, hold, hold it, hold it. Let me make the point, okay? My point is you need to know who that is because once you attend that meeting, you need to feed them your information. You need to have their emails, telephone numbers, so you can contact them. That's, 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 my, that's my point. There's no point in you just being a citizen going down the list and stuff and not passing that on to the, your legislative group. Okay, now your question. And um, if we, it, if the ethics committee, they have to bring it to the floor? No, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not that easy. I, I didn't want to get down in the mud, but I will briefly. The ethics commission has to present their rules to the legislature. That just means that they send them to the speaker, the pro tem. Then the legislature has to 
one of the members, I will, somebody else will, has to craft a motion that says we reject these ethics commission rules. Then they have to be voted on. And what happens, I've done it before, then you get some leader in the legislature, the speaker of the pro tem, that won't allow it to come up for a vote. So it gets much more difficult than that. But it's election year, so we'll see if the speaker and the pro tem want to do that. And let me just go back to one other thing. Representative Bands is Representative Cooksey's desk mate. He voted for that ridiculous 14-day rule. You ought to call him and say, Representative Bands, I am astounded that you voted for that, and I understand the Ethics Commission is proposing it again, and I would uh, sure like to see you change your position. See, that's why I bring a point very important for you to know who, and then to know you also. Okay, to know who you actually are, and the more letters you write to them, or literally go contact them in person so they actually see a face, very, very important. You're going to be very effective in what you're doing by doing it that way. I don't know if people realize that there are several representatives and senators that are on YouTube now. If you subscribe to, I think it's the state capitol, something, they're actually on YouTube and they explain a law that they're either involved in or they're trying to pass, which I found very interesting and, and very, very um, helped me with my knowledge of it. I would find it more interesting if they would take the time to explain on the floor. Because then when they get questions, their explanations don't stand up. Okay, okay, let's go to the next question. Your name, first name, David. David, so I think you just answered. You're saying then that it really won't come up for a vote even if you say, I want to reject these, and they just won't let it. No, I'm saying that the potential exists. It's, it, someone has to write the resolution, maybe I will, that says, I reject the ethics submission rules, then it has to get a vote in the House and a vote in the Senate and the signature of the governor to reject it. They've made it very difficult uh, right. to do that. So how, how, on average, does it get rejected very often then? This is a wholesale rewrite there's never been a, a, a situation like this. They've done a wholesale rewrite of the rules that will put hundreds of unforeseen things. I don't have the time to analyze it. It doesn't matter because I can't do much about it. Previously, there's been simple modifications like, you know, an 80 page drill book, and on page 22, we're going to change the limit from $100 to $500. And on page 47, we're going to do this. This is like a wholesale rewrite of the book that they're claiming is new transparency for the citizens' book law. So then. So that it almost doesn't do any good to tell our legislature. Absolutely, because uh, but you, you've got to, or otherwise you've given up. You you tell your legislature you want to make sure. In fact, if I do a resolution or someone else, I want you to co-author that resolution. So the leadership has to bring it up. Okay, let me let me get in here. You, who's your representative? Mike Shelton. <laughs> I'm Shelton. And, and your senator, Constance Johnson. Oh boy. Did, okay, the, uh, I actually had a very good conversation this last week with Representative Mike Shelton, okay? The, uh, and, but anyway, very, very important. I mean, again, I cannot stress that, I mean, to the remaining people in here, and every how, important, be for it. And how important it is for you to personally get to know your representative and your senator, because again, a meeting of 25 is huge, okay? You may not think it is, but it's huge. And, and really, when you have 10 constituents contacting a representative, it's huge, okay? Because generally, nobody says anything, nothing. Let, let me tell you, the generally accepted number is one phone call represents 200 votes on that issue. Okay, let's, let me do this. I'm going to make a point here. I'm going to put him a little bit on the spot. Okay, you don't know that. Okay, well, got, and that's what we want to do in high nutrition. We want to get to know one another, and we've already talked about that. We really know representative. Here's a new representative, Mike Turner. Okay, Mike Turner. Representative. Okay, Mike. Okay, this last session. Okay. Now, how many people, Mike, last year contacted you on certain issues, or, or did anybody contact you on any issue? Well, uh, I actually got to think about it a handful of times. That's yeah, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm trying to think. Uh, actually, like for just by virtue of my district, the most frequent constituents I interacted with were lobbyists. Uh, I think I averaged one constituent per week. That's it. One. Uh, I'm just no one bothers to contact me, and I just rely kind of on what I remember from knocking at the door. Um, you know, I do surveys and stuff like that, but uh, 
you know, you'd be amazed at how few people actually bother to uh, interact. Uh, in fact, I, I can sit there and say that from what I do know is that if you're a rural legislator, um, you spend more time, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, feuds between your constituents and anything else, if you will. Um, you know, yes, you're helping them out. It's considered, you know, you know uh, your constituent service, you know, to, to intervene on behalf of some DHS matter or something like that. But in terms of guiding policy, um, you're not going to catch them unless it's like, you know, absolutely blowing up in the news, like the horse slaughter bill. You had every single bleeding heart coming out about that. Um, that was really about the only one that I had any emails for, and I would probably say one out of 150 emails I averaged on that was from my constituent. So, I mean, they just don't bother to get involved. So when you show up, um, it's a big deal, and especially if you get FaceTime. And actually, if you want to, if, if I was a constituent, and you want to catch a representative's attention, um, the biggest thing that I'm a fan of is uh, announce you know, your intention. You'll make certain that the guy doesn't agree with you, but be like, you know, you're, you'll see me uh, on the ballot. You know, that threat, they will take seriously. Well, no, not even, you know, that's the thing is that I wouldn't even spend time dealing with them coming here. I just sit there and just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then come April, when with the filing fee of $200, get your name on the ballot, uh, especially the Senate. You know, the, the Senate is the source of a lot of problems. Um, you know, that's where things go to die and make everybody feel good, because. You know, they only run every four years, and uh, they don't like going out and campaigning. They just don't. So by you spending, two, or by an individual spending $200, uh, you're able to make that senator have to spend, uh, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars just to the, just to contend with one person. I mean, you want to catch their attention. That, I can think of no finer way uh, than getting under the craw of a senator uh, than by doing that. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I, you know, rather than lobbying or you know, spending dollars to a mail piece, I just sit there and, you know, find someone to go, not even run against it, just clog up the process. You know, nothing's better than having 100 people on a ballot. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's rather crazy, but, I mean, I, I got to say that, you know, it's, it's one method to do that. <laughs> but again, but again, I'm trying to make the point, okay? Here's a new representative, here's an old representative, and I'm not talking about age either. <laughs> <laughs> Grand, we have grandpa and the, and the new generation of American citizens coming up, okay? We have two different spectrums here. Nobody contacts our representatives, okay? We're not, now we're talking statewide and also federal-wide. So if you could get, now I know you know probably five people in your district. I know you know five people in your district that are voters. If you can get them to go talk to your representative, you have changed the course of of that representative's thinking or making them think that this is going to be very, very costly. Okay? Positively or negatively, I mean, both sides of that deal. And you've got to be fair. At the same time, let's take a state representative that nobody ever contacts them. What are they supposed to think? You've given them no influence in what they're supposed to do, other than certain campaign promises they may have run when they first run. But with a lot of these House races and Senate races, they never draw upon us. So what Representative Turner's actually telling you is it's worth, that may be some of the best $200 you ever spent by just filing on them and making yourself get on the ballot and or somebody that you would technically agree with, okay? Do you, so do you understand kind of the direction we're going with the conversation? You, it's incumbent upon citizenry to get involved in the political process. And, and, and let me just mention, you know, that. Basically, incumbents, um, the statistics are like 98 or 99 percent of incumbents are reelected. That's in the old days. And that's changing. I believe there were five incumbents defeated in the last election, which was like uh, 10 or 15 percent. There's one right here. And this one right here, the reason I brought that up is because his representative was not doing the things that he told his district he was doing. And Mike gets out there knocks on the door and exposes it and he wins and so um, that you know you, by showing up and talking to your representative you expose them on the issue they can't just equivocate they're going to have to say and boy if they say the wrong thing to you you're going to tell all your friends and it's going to be a landslide a landslide see another one on the federal side of that deal what you're talking about on the federal side of that 
is that Jim Brinstein from Tulsa, Congressman Brinstein, he's a perfect example to challenge an incumbent. A very expensive thing to do, but he won by $25, $50 donations and got out there and challenged. Just look, Representative Turner, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, same plus, plus all one of them hats and Turner Brother hats. <laughs> uh, no, on, on the getting out and uh, challenging, uh, that's one of the things that I remember very clearly is just the lack of uh, active participation by the citizens. The fact that you bother to show up and do anything politically related uh, means that you're automatically in a very, very small group um, where you understand things going on, you're willing to be involved. Um, a lot of voters, though, aren't like that. 95% uh, of primary voters, I would venture, are not politically engaged. They just happen to show up and vote. Um, and so that's actually a, a significant concern. So whenever you go out and pound doors and you're wanting to see some change, you have to bring the information with you and you basically have to force feed it to people. And they'll either get tired of it or they'll be excited that you bring it by. Either way, you force them to get off the fence and they can no longer live in ignorance. Grassroots. Well, that's, that's the whole purpose of grassroots. I mean, is to go out there and get after it. I mean, Especially for you. I don't, yeah, I mean, I've pounded 11,000 doors in three and a half months. So, I mean, I was, I was kind of an oddball, um, you know, and that's where it's like, I'm not going to lie. I prefer not to have a challenger just because it allowed me to go and pound doors for other people because I get, there's some people in the house that I prefer not to see uh, reelected. Um, and, and, and I'd like to go out and, and pound doors in other districts because I, I, I enjoy that. Um, and then also, because I don't take uh, lobbyist contributions, I don't take PACs, lobbyist principal. Basically, I, I gotta know you in order to take, to take any contributions. So that, that puts me in a whole other category. Um, and, and that's actually what actual Representative Reynolds was saying. Uh, lobbyists actually hold a significant amount of power just by virtue of it's their dollars that allow a lot of these representatives and senators to feel really important. Um, you know, for a lot of them, I hate to say it, it's going to be the nicest job they ever have. And that's not necessarily a, a good thing. People pounding the street for you is going to help. Oh, yeah. Um, no, 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 no question. I mean, that's the greatest thing in the world is, you know, the best, uh, best marketing campaign is viral. And uh, being able to have, you know, generate it from word of mouth. Anything else is just inconsequential. Uh, no, no question about it. Um, you know, uh, that's where I know David, you know, being in Connie Johnson and Mike Shelton's district, uh, oddly enough, is uh, just because he happens to be a district that won't represent, or his, that their, uh, his legislative leaders may not uh, represent his views, all he's got to do, or anybody has to do, is go find a legislator uh, who will listen to him because. Um, I know on, on certain, you know, transparency and gov mod things that uh, a lot of people that live outside my district that come to me with ideas, and, and I enjoy that. Um, I, I encourage it. You know, I, I don't care where it is. I mean, I'm a process wonk uh, more than anything. Um, I, I enjoy the how things are built and how to sit there and shape it and, and change the underlying infrastructure. Um, I'm not so much concerned with, you know, the high altitude stuff, but I, I have so many problems with the, uh, the infrastructure that's going on. That that's to me a far bigger threat. Um, you know, once again, uh, lobbyists and agencies, the executive branch, uh, the way that they manipulate the power, the way that uh, the Senate holds a disproportionate amount of power that we've allowed that. Yeah, I'd say it's, it, you know, it hasn't really uh, drastically changed. I mean, uh, the citizens get screwed by and large. I mean, a lot of it's absence, I and mean, you can sit there and go up on not on a day when there's a, an important debate. But uh, a day where there's 10 to 15 bills of <clears throat> rather mundane, boring looking titles. And the best thing you can do is to stand up in the gallery and you'll see a bunch of representatives pull out of their desk uh, something that says the Reed Report. And you know, it's the saddest thing in the world to me that that's their, that that's their voting guy. And there are people that sit there and, and gloat about how they have 100% uh, Reed score. Not saying that's necessarily bad, if that's the district, so be it. But when you sit there and pull, open your desk drawer, you pull that out, oh, well, it says, yeah, okay, yeah, and that's how you do it. Well, I, that's disingenuous to your own decisions. It tells me you didn't read the bill, you don't know what the world's in it, and frankly, you shouldn't be up there for it. Because if, if someone else is telling you how to vote, my God, why don't we just go ahead and have that other thing be represented instead? I'm going to give you a little biblical scripture to deal with this. I mean, now, I'm not asking if you believe in it, okay, but I'm just telling you, this is for thousands of years of this scripture, okay? 
A rich man has many friends, and a poor man is even woeful by his own neighbors. The uh, I.E. meaning, okay, I'm going to put this, what I'm going to say kind of in perspective here, a representative is loved by the wise. Loved by the wise is, okay, the average citizen is, is not welcome in the state capital generally, okay? Now, unless you're a big time donor, then you're always welcome. So, cut to the chase the whole thing. Money, you know, money walks and we know the rest of that whole deal. But it's incumbent upon you to be involved. You involved in your citizenry, at your state capital, misgovernment, and on and on. Don't just blame bad representatives. Lots of them may have had the greatest attempt when they first got elected in public office to do the right thing. But because somebody like you never showed up, they become friends with somebody that you now despise. So that so anyway, it's so incumbent upon us and our government. Mike Turner, Representative Turner, I really do appreciate you because of the hard work that you're doing because this guy is the future of the United States of America. It's people like him. Now guys like me and Mike, Mike Reynolds and us old people with beard, gray beards and no hair, I mean we're not the future of the country. The only thing we can do is support guys like this guy, okay? Because this guy is the guy who's going to represent my children and my grandchildren. The, uh, uh, so it's very important to not only support him monetarily, emotionally, when I, when I say emotionally, is be up there sending him things that I appreciate you and on and on what you're doing and, and those kind of issues. Okay. Just a general question. I sometimes have sent a little donation to someone. I, I, I get a lot of e conservative emails and uh, I read them and, and I'm stirred up by them, and then, but it, but then they want you to sign a petition, and so I don't know if the petition is important or if it's a way to get my email. But once I sign it, or once I give maybe a ten dollar donation on my PayPal or something, then from then on I get calls from them, and I because you have to fill out a form, and I get um, phone calls and lots of emails and even mailings. And I'm thinking, are these petitions worthless? Because I've stopped answering them because I don't know at what point, I don't know if these are useful or if they're just baiting me. <laughs> well, uh, I can only speak for myself on those. Uh, in regards to anything that looks like a form letter to me gets a canned response. Because as far as my view is that if you haven't bothered to educate yourself personally, then why would I take the time and effort to educate you on the matter. Because I, I can distinctly tell a computer uh, from someone's actual response, especially when I get 40 of the same thing. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just draft a uh, standard letter and I'll send it back with the uh, generic response. So it may be an interesting topic to you, but uh, I, all I can say is that what goes with me is that if it seems to come from a person, I will always send back a full-blown response and I'll actually take the time uh, to sit there and hem and haw about all the different nuances of the issue. But uh, what, I just can't understand, you know, uh, form generated. It's, it's a feel good for that in-between party, you know? So it's like, oh, well, I don't have to worry about that. You know, it's gonna do something for me. But if it's not in your mind, it's not in your legislative mind. I can only speak for me, because I mean, I value that human connection, that, that human contact, the fact that someone would take the time and energy, because that means that they deserve my time and energy in response. Oh. Let, let, me, uh, let me hit that for just a second. Um, in my previous life, I still was doing computer consulting. I did the computer work for a fundraising firm. And they raised money for a lot of different organizations that you would know, which I'm not going to name. And, and so they would call and they say, hi, I'm, I'm raising money for such and such. And you would give them money because you felt like it was a worthy cause. Every two months, they have a different campaign. So once you've given them the first time, then those exact same people are gonna call you two months later from a different campaign. And then two months later, because they know, in fact, the master file is called the tap file, because they've tapped into your money. <laughs> and big contributors, if let's say you gave $1,000, those companies typically get anywhere from 20 to 60% of the amount they collect. Now, I'm not saying that's true of all these different political campaigns, but that's how it works. 
If you, ta if you give money unbeknownst to one campaign, your name is going to get shared. Somebody else is going to hit you because they know, hey, this is someone who's willing to give. You should reserve your money to people or groups that you specifically know are doing well. Uh, and, and I'm not going to say everyone's bad. I mean, the Liberty Council, I think the world of them. There's some that I know about that I want to support. But if I don't know them, forget it, because all you're going to do is get your name widely circulated on other lists. So sometimes it'll say there's a petition. We need to sign a petition. Forget the money. There's a petition. We need to sign this petition today to tell them that you don't want them to, and it names something, of course, you don't want them to do. Well, does that have any power? Uh, should I pass that on? Because I'm getting lots of them, and I it, forget not, the money. Do you not think that they're petition. passing? Uh, if they're not getting to 10 million people, how's it going to matter that you get to another? I get emails forward to me at the Capitol. I'll get the same email, the same hot news out of Washington or whatever, sent to me by 10 different people. Do those people think I didn't already get it from that group that sent it? And they all forwarded so it to the me. So the petitions are not important then to I'm sign. not going to say they're not important. I'm How just, would you know which one is important? I, I just don't do any of them. But, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. You want to ask? Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, you know, spot on. Is that you, can, you, know, you can tell the difference between Something that's you know form and design to sit there and get someone worked up over nothing versus an actual person taking the time to read. But that goes back to you know everything in general. You know, circling all the way back to what Representative Reynolds was talking about earlier is uh, you know transparency. Is that you know good, bad, or indifferent? I mean, the, the facts are there. It's just a lot of people don't know how to search for it, and uh, a lot of people, um, even though it's public information, um, it, it's it may as well not be just because so few people uh, know about it. And so you know, there's nothing wrong with increased transparency, especially uh, the financial motives of people. You know, it's buried in X, Y, Z. It's not, you know, really easy, you know, uh, to sit there and connect the dots. And so whenever those dots are connected, um, sometimes it'll get people riled up. Sometimes it won't. And that's why, you know, these outside lobbyist groups and interests and whatnot, they're not, they're not inherently evil. Now, but, you know, we can't mistake the fact that uh, the rules have been set up uh, to favor uh, entrenched individuals. And it's only when you, you exert a lot of energy are you able to fully bring that out in the daylight. I mean, I, I can't honestly think of too many legislators that are uh, in not pure intention. Um, just, you know, and I don't speak ill of, of any of them, but, you know, it can never hurt to sit there and, and ask, well, what about this issue? It's like, why'd you vote? Uh, yes or no on this particular one. It's like, uh, what, what were your thoughts on this? Uh, you know, because I, I just feel that you, know, they need to, you need to be accountable for all of your votes, the good, bad, and everything in between. You know, and, I, and I'm gonna, this, now this is my personal opinion on, on, your, on your question at the same time, is that I, if I'm getting hundreds of these type requests, here, here's what happened, delete, 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 delete. That's what's happening. Another thing that happens, we get these email blasts out, people asking us to contact a representative or whatever, and we go down there, and we could physically go down to the Capitol, in which some of us do, and guess what? It already got settled. Or they're not going to hear it, or they're not going to do that. And the frustration of that whole process, because you, i.e., taken off work, you've canceled an appointment, you've done whatever, whatever. But for some reason, when you went down there, down there, you were ineffective. So be very cautious, what I'm going to say, for a group to start sending out blasts to do certain kind of things or whatever, because it's kind of the, what is that, the wolf calling whatever, I can't, I'm trying to think the of boy wolf. Yeah, the boy called, yeah, calling wolf. Because what happens, you be wind up having an ineffective message. And let me just kind of transpose this into what we are doing at High Noon Club, what we attempt to do at High Noon Club. That's why we're very selectively of sending out emails out of High Noon Club. Some people are not going to like that, but we try to take that position. If we send you something, it really does mean something if it comes from High Noon Club, because we don't want you just to receive an email and not read it and hit the delete button. So I caution every group 
But again, a lot of these larger national type groups or large state type groups, they're using these for fundraising vehicles. We know that, okay? Fundraising, they could care less if you if you contact your representative not because you'll see at the bottom here send a donation for 25 50 100 and then it's representing mike reynolds says once you hit that certain dollar amount for them brother they're now selling your name to other groups selective type groups so be very cautious in what you're actually doing there and obviously always the best thing for anybody to do is make personal contact with people like these two guys right here, okay, Representative Reynolds and Representative Turner. That's the very best effective thing. Email, great. Telephone calls, okay. Personal contact, perfect. Okay, eye to eye contact. Because nobody understands the sincerity of how you actually feel about an issue rather than eye to eye contact, okay? Go ahead. One of the things that uh, has happened, and I'm trying to get a rule passed that can't, that'd be great for transparency. Let's say uh, some group wants to donate, they're going to give $500. The Oklahoma Bankers Association, I hate to use them, if there is such a thing. They want to give $500 to, to 50 legislators. But what they'll do is they will write the $500 checks with the legislators' names, but then they'll give the check to the pro tem of the Senate, and uh, for all the senators. They'll give the checks to the to the Speaker of the House for all the House members. And, and you say, well, why would they do that? Well, it's real simple. They get, they get two things. The Speaker of the House is really indebted to them because now he gets to go. Let's say I was a Speaker. I get to go and say, Representative Turner, here's $500 from the Oklahoma Bankers Association. And Representative Turner doesn't remember the Oklahoma Bankers Association at all. He remembers me, the guy that delivered it. And that's how it works, I promise you. But the Bankers Association is appreciative of the Speaker, and the Speaker remembers the Bankers Association because they just empowered him to get good graces of all those people that he gave those $500,000, $5,000 checks to. I have tried to pass a rule. If we really want to clean up government, all checks from lobbyists and PACs have to be mailed directly to the candidate and can't be given, delivered to anybody else. Well, that, I mean, who could argue with that? No, nope, they won't even hear it. So that's just another example. Okay, we kind of understand where we're going on this whole thing. Yeah, don't just blame our representatives. I mean, if they've done something wrong, we as citizens need to take blame for allowing that to happen. And we, when we don't get engaged, somebody's going to get engaged and that's our fault that's not their fault that's our fault and literally the way i look at politics it's nothing but a business deal there's so much business i.e same type operations happen in business i mean those business people that generally engage in the market are more successful than the ones that don't even try okay and as citizens if we do not try we're getting exactly the form of government that we want and we may not like it, but we'll get what we want. Our founding fathers, from i.e., from the state, kept, from the state constitution or, or the federal level, with our founding fathers, there, they gave us the constitution, the right to vote. Soldiers continually go to the battlefield today, dying for your right to vote and get engaged. So when we do not do this, we're giving up our public liberties, and that's what hopefully we always do at High Noon Club. We try to get you motivated to get engaged in your government. Yeah, the, the, the people have them themselves to blame, uh, good, bad, or indifferent for their representation in government. It's all the ultimate responsibility is with them. You get you you always elect the perfect person for that group by the very virtue of either that group doesn't care or they care really particular about X Y Z, and, and so it, it always works. That, that's how it is. It's the most uh, ironically beautiful thing. I um, mean, the only way that you can ever change that is uh, if you have an outside force, aka a, a concerned citizen, go above and beyond uh, the norm and stand outside the 95% of case and become uh, you know super active um, and, and reach out. I mean, the more social connections you get, uh, the more likely you are to be able to affect change. And, and weirdly enough, you can't do it within a vacuum. You have to go out and engage with people that uh, normally uh, aren't, you know, too politically aware. Even though they may vote, they're not politically aware. 
and you need to go make them politically aware. And you'll be either a friend or whatever. And I, and I always, again, I say that face-to-face -face contact where people literally know you, you know them, what they look like. So when you read the newspaper, say, oh, gosh, I actually know that person. I mean, and that's not true, or that is true. I mean, whatever decision you made. So today, what you've actually done, I know this probably never happened before, but today you personally got to really know and talk to two sitting House representative people that were elected public office, which I'm going to almost assure you now, I'm going to probably be wrong on this, but I'm going to make this little statement anyway. You probably have never personally ever talked to your state representative, okay? But today, you've had the opportunity at High Noon Club to come down here and literally discuss what's on your heart, feelings with two people. And you now know these two people, okay? That kind of thing. So when it's all done, let's all shake hands and you can hug them or whatever you want. And they won't be, they won't be offended by that. That kind of thing. But again, I appreciate both of you guys. I mean, very much so. And at the same time, we've got other representatives that feel the same way that they do. And I'm going to say almost all of them do. That's why they, most people run for public office, because they want to serve. Now, obviously, there's certain people that are sociopathic or whatever. You could say that they're doing it because for their own pocketbook. But initially, everybody goes into office to serve. And it's because we as a public didn't get engaged is why other people did. Again, thank you very much. What's in the high new call? What's in it today? And, and, OK. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. And we'll see you all in two weeks.